Prior to that time, I had had no association at all with the use of the knife in any other form other than for hunting purposes and general utility purposes. It soon became evident after 200,000 of the Fairburn Sykes knives had been issued by the British Ordnance during World War II that the Fairburn Sykes had a number of deficiencies that needed to be corrected. And it was on this basis that W. E. Fairburn and I decided to make an improvement on the Fairburn Sykes knife as it is known today. By the time 1943 had come to an end, there were no, numerous combat reports of the efficiency of the Fairburn Sykes knife. There was also a very evident need in the British Armed Forces, where these knives were issued, for a utility knife in place of the Fairburn Sykes knife, because the Fairburn Sykes commando knife was misused. The troops used them for as pry bars, they used them as uh, to open ration cans, to probe for mines, and many other uses for which the knife originally was not intended. Bill Sykes told me that when he and Fairburn were assigned to design a fighting knife for the British commandos and the armed forces, that the time element was very short, and that he and Fairburn went to London to the Tower of London Museum to see about what kind of knives and designs possibly could be adapted to the modern needs of World War II. One of the interesting points was that at that time that London was under bombing and all of the exhibits at the Tower of Museum a Tower of London Museum had been wrapped up and stored away, but they were given a priority and the cases were opened up and they decided after examining a lot of the medieval knives that were on hand and others that the Fairburn knife design or Fairburn Sykes if you will would follow that of the medieval dagger. The dagger was a thrusting weapon. It was originally designed to go through the chinks of armor after a knight had been downed and to give the coup de grace, as the saying goes. In any event, they selected the design and came up with it, and the first knives were made by Will Wilkinson Sword in a limited production. The knife I have in my possession, which is one of my most treasured knives, is the one that Fairburn gave me uh, early in the war, which was one of those made by Wilkinson Sword. The problem of the Fairburn Sykes knife was not only because it was misused, but because the design was such that it would not 
slash, or cut. The narrow width of the blade, the thickness of the blade, were such that the angle of the edge was was such a such a sharp angle that the knife could not be sharpened in any manner so that it would cut successfully. In combat, a number of other design faults appeared. The knife broke off at the hilt. It broke off at the tip. The tang was a round rod tang which came down and uh, was on this knob here was the end where the tang was cut off to hold on to the handle this was riveted on. The tang was too weak and too narrow because of its round rod structure. Another difficulty that was encountered in the production of the Fairburn Sykes knives was the fact that many of them were made of inferior materials. This was wartime and the manufacturers made the knives with whatever steel and other materials they could scrounge or get their hands on and there was no particular standard involved. The handles were different on many of the, of the Fairburn Sykes knives. The handle materials were different. Another basic problem of the Fairburn Sykes knife was the fact that <coughs> it had a Coke bottle shaped handle. This was very evident after reports came back that a number of men had tried to cut people or the enemy with the, with the blade and you had to use, and use the flat of the blade rather than the edge principally because they had no way at night when, where most of the knife fighting takes place of locating where the edge of the blade was by feel. This was a serious problem and also the handle was small and Whenever the blade encountered resistance, the handle sometimes turned. And uh, sometimes, if it encountered resistance of enough uh, energy involved, the, uh, the knife would slip from the hand of the user. On many of the production knives, the tip of the knife, the Fairburn Sykes knife, was too thin. And the tips of the knife would break off. This was not entirely due to misuse of combat, but was also due to the troops lying around when they had nothing else to do and throwing them at trees and other objects to while away the time while, while waiting for battle and uh, breaking up their knives uh, accordingly. The OSS manufactured a knife of the Fairburn Sykes design, such as I'm holding here in my hand. This knife was particularly bad and with regard to the blade as it was extremely thin and made of what presumably was some sort of a spring steel. However, the, the tip was so thin that this particular production of the OSS knife was really not suitable for combat in any, any way or form. The various flaws in the initial design of the Fairburn Sykes knife was naturally of some concern to Sykes and Fairburn. I was first aware of it while in England on temporary duty and associated with Sykes. When I returned to the States, and worked with Fairburn, we decided that we would make up or design and make up some prototypes of knives that possibly would be the answer to the various flaws that had become apparent in the original design. And accordingly, 
some of these prototypes were made up and one of which I have been able to retain. This knife was made in the OSS machine shop and follows quite closely the design we fi finalized on with some minor differences in the handle in the first Applegate Fairburn production in 1981. I think we can truthfully say that the Applegate Fairburn knife was the only knife ever designed based on actual combat experience. We tried to answer all of the flaws and criticisms of the original commando knife and also added several other features to the knife that have made it more of a combat weapon. Everett and I were experimenting with prototypes for a new pure fighting knife design to replace the Fairburn Sykes model. Some other makers had started to make small production, limited production runs of knives in the United States for the armed forces. The most well known of these makers was Randall of Florida. Eck knives also were produced during this period as well as other knives of lesser fame. I would like to state here, however, that we're talking about pure fighting knives. And a pure fighting knife has to be a double-edged weapon. And if it's a double-edged weapon, you're able to use it with the proper type of technique and instruction in a way which is far superior and more effective than any technique ever designed for a single-edged blade. This is quite important and not very well understood. And even today, martial arts instructors and other instructors are designing knife fighting techniques around the single-edged blade. And this, of course, is a matter of preference, but again, we do not believe that it is anything that uh, justifiable in the light of current knowledge regarding the use of a double-edged blade in combat. With the double-edged blade, we were able to develop fighting techniques and methods that were far superior and although combat on one-on-one -on -one basis, knife against knife, was very infrequent. I would wager that anybody trained in the proper technique of a double-edged blade would be able to overcome or outlast, outcut, out whatever anyone trained in a single-edge blade knife fighting technique. 99% of the time, troops do not need double-edged blades for use in combat or any other form because their use in normal wartime with a knife of, is for the single-edged blade type, such as the Marine Corps K-Bar. These are utility knives whereas the double-edged blade knife is made pure and simple for a fighting and as a fighting implement. The best known knife of U.S. manufacture other than the mass-produced K-Bar was the Randall Number no. 1. This knife was carried by troops of all types and in all theaters of the war. 
and justly deserves its fame. However, it was not, as I mentioned before, a fighting knife in the pure sense. The Randall number no. two was designed for the purpose of a pure fighting weapon. And I was influential with Randall in those days in establishing this design on the market. And later on wrote the booklet for him on knife fighting that is in print to this day. The Randall number no. two contains a number of the same features that you will see in the Applegate Fairburn, which we will discuss later. And was a fine knife, but again, was not the final answer to what I consider to be the final word in fighting knives, and that has become the Applegate Fairburn design, as it is currently produced. World War II was too far along and priorities on producing knives were too low so that the Applegate Fairburn design was not mass produced. Instead, aside from several prototypes and some drawings I had made, the knife remained in my trunk and in storage for the almost 30 years. It was not until the more recent interest in knives of all types, including fighting knives, that I resurrected the knife and had it made by custom knife makers, as is now the case. However, the prototypes were made over the years. The first prototype you see on the board was the one made in the OSS machine shop. The second prototype was made from drawing to the knife that I sent to a friend of mine who was an officer in Thailand during the Vietnam, Vietnam War. This in turn led to the development of the prototype manufactured by, or custom made if you were, by Barry Wood, in which the longitudinal grooves in the handle appear. Finally, the knife was custom produced and offered to the public by custom knife maker T.J. Yancey in 1981. Semi-production custom knife of Applegate Fairman design was made by T.J. Yancey, a well-known custom knife maker. Approximately 400 of these knives were made by Mr. Yancey. At that time, due to illness and other reasons, the production of the knife with its custom blade was switched to Mr. William Harsey, a well-known knife maker of Cresswell, Oregon. These knives are still being produced and over a thousand of them are in use today throughout the world by various special forces 
and special units having a need for a pure fighting weapon. I think probably we ought to discuss the features of the Applegate Fairburn that resulted from the experience in World War II of the uh, Fairburn Sykes and resulted in the current superior knife for fighting purposes. The blade is wide and extremely sharp due to the angle of the blade in relation to the angle of the, of the Fairburn Sykes because of the different design. The blade is thick at the point. With the Applegate Fairburn, it is possible to cut, thrust, thrust, and slice, as well as to use it in the traditional dagger-type fashion. The cross guard of the Applegate Fairburn is fitted to the thumb. And if you will notice that my thumbnail is not behind the cross guard. This means that when the blade is thrust and immediate resistance such as a hip bone or any kind of harness or whatever else would occur in combat and the knife comes to a sudden stop that the thumbnail will not peel back off the off the hand of the user as is the case and was the case in the in the uh, Fairburn sites. The handle of the Applegate Fairburn is made of Lexan, a polycarbonate. This is one of the toughest of the known plastics and enables a number of features to be incorporated that could not be incorporated normally in a custom knife. One, the longitudinal grooves are present. This enables the knife to be held in the hand with a convulsive grip, which would be the case in combat, in such a manner that the fingers, the flesh of the fingers, compress into the, into the grooves. This, along with the design of the handle, prevents the knife from turning or slipping once sudden resistance to the thrust of the knife is encountered. It also is very helpful because the palm of the hand sweats in combat due to excitement and other reasons and consequently anything that can be done to prevent slippage is uh, very critical. Also, there are some notches in the, in the handle of the Applegate Fairburn on both sides. These notches enable the user to grip the knife in such a manner, day or night, by feel if necessary, so that he knows at all times exactly where the edge is. So he will not be using the flat of the blade, as was the case of the Fairburn Sykes. The weight of the handle of the Applegate Fairburn is to the rear, toward the hilt. This is done by the means of lead weights and placed in the handle and is correct for a fighting knife. Fairburn Sykes 
commando knife with its narrow rod type tang. The Applegate Fairburn tang is a full width tang and will not be weak at the critical point of the where the cross guard is on the blade. Balance on fighting knives should be handle heavy. And it's an interesting experiment that we use many times in development to determine exactly what type of a balance was the instinctive balance or the favorite balance of a knife. What we would do, we would take a number of men who are unfamiliar with fighting knives, blindfold them, and we would lay out a number of knives on the table. For instance, a Gerber, an Applegate Fairburn, a Randall number one, an Eck, a Fairburn Sykes, and any number of other knives of so similar design and make, and ask them to pick up each knife while blindfolded and to determine from this means which one felt the best. And nine times out of ten, the Applegate Fairburn, because of its weighted handle, would be the selection. And for no other reason than the instinctive feel. It's like a favorite golf club or a favorite baseball bat. Some knives feel better than others. The weighted handle also has the other fit factor of when the knife strikes resistance in a cut or a thrust, the weighted handle helps in, along with the design, in retaining the knife in the hand when it meets resistance, such as a bone or harness or whatever else uh, might be in the way of the completed slash or thrust. Generally speaking, blades of all, of all generally well-known fighting knives are from five to six and a half to seven inches in length. And the overall length of the knife is anywhere from 11 to 13 inches. There is no particular criteria as to why a knife should be a certain blade length or have a certain handle length except the criteria in the mind of the designer. However, there was one instance that sticks in my mind from World War II where blade length was of some importance. 